It's a pleasure to be with you today to present my latest research, which has just been accepted for publication in the journal Resources Conservation and Recycling, and uh, basically goes through the history and diversity of circularity and circular economy related discourses. Um, so I'm going to take you through uh, the history, precursors and current um, di different positions regarding this topic. Um, so first, what is the circular economy? Uh, so it's very much seen as a cure to a lot of the social and ecological problems of the 21st century. Um, many people find it to be a cure to resource scarcity, thanks to the reuse, reduce, recycling, repairing, refurbishing, remanufacturing of pretty much everything to design out waste. Um, it can also be a cure to climate change, thanks to great improvements in energy efficiency and renewable energy systems pretty much everywhere. Also a cure to food scarcity, uh, thanks to circular and regenerative agricultural practices that bring back organic waste from cities to the fields and thus regenerate soils. And we also have a cure to environmental degradation, as many say, thanks to the ability to design out pollution and environmental externalities. It is also seen as a way to uh, increase or rather deal with unemployment and economic stagnation because it generates a lot of wealth uh, and it is uh, seen as an ability to create growth or a tool to create green growth rather. However, it is facing crucial challenges to deliver on all these expectations, mainly two challenges. First, it fails to build a systemic and holistic understanding of what social and political implications a circular future could have. And in that regard, it doesn't ask questions of who controls circular technologies and resources, and also who benefits from them and who pays for them. Will the most vulnerable have the most heavy burden? As the Gilets jaunes protests show in France, this is not necessarily a good way towards a transformation. In addition to this, it doesn't ask how we can re brand or, 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 or democratize our political systems in order to make everybody uh, empowered in this transformation in a democratic manner. And therefore, it lacks quite a lot of social relevance in an age of inequality. Um, moreover, second large problem is that it doesn't deal with a complex relationship between circular economy decoupling and economic growth. Now, while circular economy is often portrayed as a tool for green growth, there's no evidence that we can continue GDP growth while also reducing environmental impact. Most studies have actually found this to be quite impossible. Therefore, the circular economy, if seen as a tool for growth, might not actually bring the ecological benefits that we are expecting and therefore might lack systemic validity. In addition to this, um, well, rather in combination to this, um, there is a narrative of greenwashing by a lot of governments and corporations that use this depoliticized discourse of a circular economy that benefits everyone and everything uh, without really uh, getting into the nitty gritty and controversial issues of social implications and political participation and, and growth and or the inability of therefore to continue growing in a limited planet. And this allows for the concept to get widespread support in the in both uh, business and government side circles and political circles, but uh, it also uh, might be a tool that doesn't really bring transformative change. Now, however, if we look at the discourse of the circular economy from a historical perspective and we see all its interrelated um, ideas, then we do see that many of them do tackle this. Um, uh, so let's go quickly through history. Now, I'm going to start in 1945 because of time. But really, circular economy existed in our human societies since the beginning of time, really. We have always been circular. All civilizations were circular pastoralist, agriculturalist societies, all uh, nurtured um, nature and, and continuously reused everything. It is only since uh, the Industrial Revolution, really, that our economy became linear with the avenue of fossil fuels and industrial technologies. Now, uh, there start to be a big um, a movement, especially in the 40s, 60s, 70s, in order to reconcile the industrial system with economic, uh, well, rather resource imperatives of, of nature and the limited resources of our planet. 
One of the first of these is Gandhian economics, also called economy of permanence. It seeks to uh, create a society in continuous harmony with nature. We also have a seminal book called The Limits to Growth that was published in the 60s, that, uh, or rather in 72, that uh, shows the limits of the planet and the limits of an industrial system, and therefore the necessity to go beyond growth in order to create a sustainable society. And a lot of propositions also arose in the 60s and 70s, such as the closing circle by Barry Commoner, one of the first uses of the term circular to propose actually an eco-socialist future that is completely regenerative um, and redistributive. We also have propositions like Design for the Real World that took a really transformative social and really empowering approach to design, um, where design was a real tool for transformation ecologically and socially. Uh, we also have Small is Beautiful by Schumacher that proposes from Buddhist economics a form to transform our society in a harmonious manner and steady state economics, which also uh, faced with the conditions of a limited natural resources proposes a society or an economy that does not grow, does not need to grow. Um, so the 60s and 70s, as you see, was really a fervent moment for really a lot of different ideas. And there was a real questioning of both the social implications and the growth-based uh, systemic necessities or rather uh, limitations of our planet. And thus, they included the two main challenges that I included, that I talked about before. Uh, now in the 80s, however, um, the talk of ecological um, movements was was quite different and especially the talk of circularity and waste management became more of a practical issue something that could be dealt with through technology and efficiency um, and therefore we have the rise of industrial ecology we have the rise of industrial metabolism of reverse logistics biomimicry all of these try to copy the metabolisms of nature and the forms of functioning of nature in order to create new technologies and efficiencies within our own industrial system, therefore gaining um, in innovative ways to design out pollution, to recycle waste, to recycle waste waters, to reuse materials efficiently. Um, and they, they come with a lot of innovative solutions that are applicable and practical uh, and that can be implemented within the current industrial system without having necessarily to transform beyond capitalism. And they don't really question, however, topics of social equity and social distribution of these benefits and who pays for it. Uh, they don't also question very much um, the ability or not of the planet to sustain continuous economic growth. So it's a very market-based approach. It's a very um, kind of, approach fueled by technology and uh, it's actually the circular economy discourse that is most common nowadays uh, so it, it actually originates from the 80s and 90s and and we're kind of especially governments and businesses seem to really rely on this kind of idea or vision of circularity now um, rather than any other now in the 2000s However, the, from the academic sector at least, and from so, some thinkers, the, there are new ideas that have emerged that include a more social vision. You have, for example, natural capitalism, the performance economy, cradle to cradle, the blue economy, which are uh, widespread as well, and include more of a social dimension. So really try to build a circular system that also tries to be just, fair and democratic. Um, so it does deal with one of the key uh, challenge that I presented earlier. However, they do not really challenge growth fundamentally, uh, and they don't challenge the current economic system fundamentally, and rather try to work within the system in order to make capitalism sustainable, in order to make the current economic system work for people and for the planet. So. Um, this is this is the new movement in the 2000s but there's also in the 2000s another movement that rise uh, in circularity which is a more transformational one here we find movements like degrowth uh with serge atouche farewell to growth seminal book on the matter in 2009 we also have eco-socialist movements uh with key 
publications in the 2000s, uh, voluntary, voluntary simplicity movements that also rise quite importantly that seek to create a grassroots local based ecological society. Uh, and from the global south, there's also a plurality of ideas that seek to go beyond development, beyond growth, beyond capitalism, uh, such as the Buen Vivir, and that originated from indigenous peoples in the Andes and in, in, in Ecuador, and also in Bolivia. And uh, these, this movement seeks to create a harmonious society, both uh, between humans and themselves, between humans and their society, and humans and nature, and thus create a real transformative way of seeing human and the natural uh, ecosystem in which we live. They also have from the global south pluriverse or rather radical pluralism that seeks to build a future in which many futures can sustainably cohabit, as they say. And uh, this, this formulation actually comes from the Chiapas, uh, indigenous uh, uprising uh, of the Zapatista movement and uh, it proposes a very democratic and transformational way to see ourselves and to see society and created this real form of governance from the bottom up where everybody is empowered uh, to both um, be a more harmonious part of society but also live more harmoniously with nature. So Basically, to put it simple, we now have two forms of circular economy, put it bluntly, or circularity discourses. Some, circular economy, we might call them, seek to cycle materials and energy resources in sustainable ways throughout the economy in order to create a sustainable system. And the other, we can call circular society, not only seek to cycle material and energy resources sustainably, but also include a social element and seek to cycle wealth power, technology, and knowledge in democratic and redistributive manners. Now, in the left side, circular economy, we can put concepts such as reverse logistics, concepts such as industrial metabolism, and on the right side, we can put um, both concepts like degrowth and buen vivir in the transformational view of a circular society that goes beyond capitalism, and include social elements, but also goes beyond growth, beyond the necessity to continuously grow, which is embedded within the capitalist system, and others which think that growth could be reconciled with ecological means, but that do include a social element, a clear social element, like cradle to cradle or the performance economy. Now, therefore, we have kind of three main uh, prevalent circular or circularity discourses right now. Um, the circular economy ones that really see circular economy through a technical lens without including any social part, a transformational circular society which seeks to go beyond capitalism, and a reformist circular society which seeks to reconcile capitalism and circularity. Um, and, and this is basically where the debate is now. If you look at the discourse, however, of most government and business circles, they're definitely right now the hegemonic discourse, the one that we are most usually confronted to, and they definitely fall within uh, the left uh, hand side or uh, circular economy discourses. And therefore uh, present this vision that we can uh, deal with circularity through technical means alone without social elements. If you want uh, to learn more about these different discourses of circularity, please look at my latest article, which was just accepted at Resources Conservation and Recycling and is forthcoming. Um, thank you very much for listening.